1 Peter, uh, as we kind of turn our thoughts to, to God's Word, you know, uh, I remember when we started this lesson series, started traveling through 1 Peter together, uh, that I, I made the comment and I said, you know, I think this is one of the more applicable New Testament letters uh, for where we find ourselves today. And I just want to kind of press that point a little bit. Christian, First uh, Peter is speaking to Christians, and they're in the first century, but they are dealing with struggles. They're dealing with trials, difficulties, uh, even persecutions from their, their Greek and their Roman neighbors. And they're dealing with these troubles because they're following Jesus. And following Jesus, they stand out from the backdrop of their culture. Now, let me just remind us, these are not just, you know, the normal everyday trials of life that they're experiencing that we all experience, but they're, they're experiencing troubles, hardships, because they have made the decision to follow Jesus, because they have put on Christ, and they are following the way of Christ. And, and I think in some ways, we can relate to that. As, as we may have family, we may have neighbors, we may have friends that don't understand why, uh, why we choose to do the, the things that we do or why we may not participate in some of the things that we used to participate with. You know, I think about, for me, my language. Um, it, it was horrible. I was in the Navy. Uh, but that's, that's something that that had to change if I was going to be a follower of Christ. Um, and today, our culture, as, I, as we just kind of look out over the landscape of our culture, our culture is experiencing a lot of change right now. And, and I suppose that each generation, there's been a, a time of change. But, but right now, I feel like our culture here in the United States is definitely changing. Ideas, social norms, uh, they're all being challenged. Uh, I follow a lot of, of articles and websites and things that, that talk about religion and theology and Christianity and, and, and what's going on right now in some circles of, of religion of Christianity is, is Christianity in many ways is being re-examined. Some are even deconstructing their faith. And, and when I say they're deconstructing their faith, it's not all bad. What I mean by that is some people are looking at what we have been taught. What have I been taught? And is it consistent with the scripture? But it's still a challenging time. Even if you're someone who's walking through that process, it's a challenging time. But not all change is bad. And at times, we need change. At times, things need to be re-examined to determine, are they good? I was just thinking about several things, events from history. The transatlantic slave trade affected some estimate between 12, uh, 10 and 12 million Africans. In the Americans, it was not abolished until 1808. Think about the mid-19th century and women's suffrage, a movement that some thought would revolutionize or change the Constitution, giving women the right to vote. In more recent history, we may think of the civil rights movements. Some of you remember well these movements of the 1960s, which in 1968 abolished racial segregation and discrimination. Not all change is bad. And at times, change is needed. But as Christians, how do we walk faithfully with the Lord amid the challenges of change and amid a culture that seems to be shifting? What is our response when we are faced with hostility, when we're faced with criticism, when we experience friction for following the way of Jesus? That's the letter of 1 Peter. That's what 1 Peter is doing. 
First Peter is instructing Christians with, through godly wisdom as they stand amid the difficulties of a changing and challenging culture. That's where we are. So in chapter 5, Peter shares his final remarks. And last week, we, we talked about church leadership, if you recall. Uh, Peter says there in chapter 5 and verse 2, Be shepherds of God's flock, which is under your care. In our lesson today, Peter is going to direct his thoughts, not so much to leadership of the church, but more of the flock or the church, the body. And many years ago, I was given a book, uh, a book to read. It was about church leadership. It was written by a man by the name of uh, Dr. Lynn Anderson. He was a graduate of ACU. The title of the book is They Smell Like Sheep. Again, it was church leadership. And this book was an exploration of, of church leadership in the 21st century and what might that need to look like. The premise of the book was leaders in the church are going to smell like sheep. And this leadership can be dangerous. It's obviously going to be smelly. But the thought is shepherds need to be with the sheep. Shepherds must be with the sheep. The implication was I was a sheep. <laughs> I didn't know quite what to think about that. I mean, I've always thought sheep could be a little more smart, so I don't know what that, that was really saying about me. But it is a metaphor that the Apostle Peter uses in chapter 5 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, let's begin our studies this morning in verse 5. Peter records, in the same way, you who are younger, submit to your elders. Notice, all of you. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Now, Peter calls all of us to walk humbly toward, toward one another and toward God. To walk humbly with God one another. The idea is that we are not so proud of ourselves that we rely on our strength, that we rely on our resources instead of following the way of Christ. We need to walk humbly with one another and with our Lord. And Jesus exemplified, he marked out this type of humble service. You recall the powerful scene of Jesus on the night he was handed over in John chapter 13, where Jesus took off his outer garments and he wrapped a towel around his waist and pouring some water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, this was a, a type of service that was not normally, uh, uh, not normally uh, done by the host of the banquet. It was normally something that would have been done by a servant in the household, but Jesus exemplifies what it means to serve humbly. And the Apostle Peter is reminding Christians, he's reminding us to follow in the humility of Christ. As Christ served, as he demonstrated this type of humility, we, as his church, need to follow in this humility. In doing so, he pulls from the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Peter reminds us that God opposes or God stands against the proud. But as the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, God revives the heart and the spirit of the humble, of the lowly. They will be exalted with him. Amid the suffering and the trials, amid the, the challenges of, of our a culture, we need to remember the example of Christ's humility. 
And we need to rely on his strength, his power, so that we, together with him, can be lifted up. And often what I find is that we have a tendency to rely on our wisdom. We have a tendency to rely on our strength. We have a tendency to rely on our understanding of justice. But following Christ, modeling this example of humility, is relying on God's wisdom. It's relying on His strength. It's relying on His justice. And sometimes I have a problem following the wisdom of God. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, it's recorded, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you. If you're looking in your notes, it's not here. I threw it in this morning. What is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God both hears and he cares about our suffering and the injustice that's done, but he calls on us to walk humbly with one another and with him. The next point that Peter makes in verse 7 kind of leads us into this thought where Peter uh, relies, relays, cast all your anxiety on God, on Him, because He cares for you. Now, I've got to tell you, there are many times that, that I think we might miss the thrust or the point that Peter may be making in this verse. Cast all your anxiety on God because He cares for you. So much of the time when I read this verse, and when I come here, my focus is on me. I need to cast all my anxiety. Get rid of it, right? Cast. But what if Peter is wanting us to focus on God and not ourselves? What if Peter wants us to see that God cares for you? Now, this maybe doesn't seem so remarkable to us. Maybe it doesn't seem all that, that new, like a newsflash in, in our culture and where we are. But I believe this was revolutionary because he cares for you. This thought of God who cares, who is responsive, who hears. I believe this was a revolutionary thought and and maybe more of where our focus needs to be, at least on this verse In the Greco-Roman culture, there would have been all types of idols, gods, all over their culture. They would have been made of stone, of wood, of precious metals, little idols, little gods everywhere. And much of many of these gods, they were worshipped, they they were prayed to for maybe a crop or a harvest or rain or some type of favor such as healing. The problem is these gods couldn't hear. They were idols. But God cares. I'm reminded of 1 Kings 18 and the prophet Elijah. Elijah, if you've not read this story in a while or if you don't remember this story, this is a classic like Western that takes place in the Hebrew Bible. Elijah has this showdown at high noon with the prophets of Baal. And it's recorded in Kings chapter 18. The prophets of Baal were to prepare a sacrifice. This, they were to build this, this wood and, and split this calf or this bull, put it on the, the wood, and they were to cry out to their God to come down and consume the sacrifice. These prophets of Baal had been leading the Israelites astray, and Elijah, the prophet of God, has come to call them back to God. And this has a fond memory of me for me because when we were young, Brenda and I, I think about the fifth grade, we got to act out this play, and I was one of the prophets of Baal. So I had to run around cutting and slicing and yelling, my, not, not physically cutting, but acting like I was cutting myself as I ran around like a crazy person 
screaming out to this God where Brenda got to be Elijah. Of course, she gets to be Elijah. <laughs> Whatever, okay. But in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 27, Elijah, at noon, begins to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a God. Perhaps he's in deep thought. Yeah, maybe he's busy traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. He needs to be awakened. They couldn't hear. God couldn't hear. Their God couldn't hear. Elijah's point is that Baal was lifeless, mute, incapable of hearing, but not the God of the Hebrews. Twelve stones are placed around the wood pile. And Elijah instructs the people to bring water and pour it all over the altar and all over the, the, the bull. So much so that, that the water ran down from the altar and consumed or fills the trench around the altar. As we move down in verse 36 of 1 Kings 18, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant and have done all the things you have commanded. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil. It also licked up the water in the trench. God hears the cries of his people. And God does not stand idly by in the midst of suffering, in the midst of injustice. You remember the story of Exodus. There's so many things that I, I was just, as I was writing this lesson, I'm like, no, we need to tell the Exodus story. No, I need to tell about a lie. There's so many things. At the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to redeem them, to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and with honey. God is concerned about injustice. He's concerned about suffering. God is concerned about the harsh treatment of his creation of people. And God hears the cries of those who are suffering. And we can have confidence that God hears our cries because he is a God who cares. And I think that's what Peter is trying to teach us. In the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your trial, God is not idle. God hears and God cares. And Peter, as he continues, kind of comes back to this metaphor of the sheep. The devil is described as a roaring lion or compared to a roaring lion who seeks to devour. Never thought about that before. But with Peter talking about the analogy of the flock, the sheep, the church, and bringing in this accuser, this adversary, as a roaring lion looking to devour the flock. Peter says in verse 8 of chapter 5, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. 
And the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the glory, be, be the power forever and ever. Amen. Is Peter encouraging us to, in the midst of difficult times, Peter's encouraging us to exercise self-control, to be alert, to be sober. The accuser, the slander, the devil, he seeks after those to devour. And like the Apostle Paul, we need to recognize it's the enemy that stirs up suffering and strife and persecution. These are not of the things of God. He stirs this up to test, possibly to devour and destroy the family of God. So many times we think our enemy is the person beside us. But Paul realized, Peter realized, our enemy does not lie with the person beside us. Our enemy is the, principality, the principalities and powers, the kingdom of this world. And Peter is is emphasizing our need for self-restraint, self-control as we identify and understand where the problem lies. Not with a neighbor, not with a friend, a co-worker. The problem lies in the enemy's lies. I say that right? <laughs> the problem is because of the enemy's lies, his deceptions as he seeks to stir strife, suffering, persecution. The church has always struggled against the backdrop of the world's culture. And at times, these attacks are, are clearly obvious. You may go back in history in the first century. We may think about the Roman Emperor Nero. Christians recognized what was happening. It was very obvious. But other times, the enemy's attacks, they're not so noticeable. It's really times of peace where we can begin to feel comfortable and a bit apathetic in our attitude about following Christ. I think the enemy is most strong because a lot of times we don't recognize what he's doing in those times. For believers, suffering trials and hardships, persecutions, they're not uncommon. Peter indicates that throughout the world, brothers and sisters in Christ are undergoing the same types of sufferings. But his encouragement is to remember our source of strength. God will restore you and make you strong. God will have you to stand firm and steadfast. First Peter is written to Christians who are suffering for following Jesus. They're experiencing hardships, trials, persecution because they follow the way of Jesus. And today, you and I, we are going to experience friction in our culture because so many things are being challenged today. Social norms, commonly held ideas and assumptions, they're all being challenged. Ideas are being challenged. Christianity is being reconsidered by many. When so much is changing, there's going to be friction. But I would caution us, not all change is bad. At times, some change is needed. But Peter is teaching us to guard our reaction. What is our response when culture seems to be moving in a different direction? That's what Peter's concerned about. And Peter's letter is a letter of encouragement as he instructs us through godly wisdom in a culture that is creating friction. What does he teach us? 
He teaches us to humbly rely on God, who hears and cares as we stand firm in the faith, because it is God who will restore and strengthen.